Welcome to Words on Air. I'm your host, Lindsay Smith. Today in our show, our guest is Ellen Stackable. She is the founder of Poetic Justice, a program that facilitates restorative writing classes for incarcerated women. She's also been a teacher at Tulsa School for Arts and Sciences for over 17 years. Welcome, Ellen. Thanks. You founded Poetic Justice in 2014. Could you tell us a little bit more about why you felt so compelled to start this organization? Well, it's interesting. I was looking up just the other day, I was trying to find something in my old files, and I realized that even four years before that, I had been looking into incarcerated women in Oklahoma. And I think because I love to teach writing and I believe in the power of voice mm -hmm. to change lives, um, I started thinking about, do these women have an ability to make their voice heard? Mm -hmm. You know, is there something out there? And the more I looked, the more I realized there really wasn't anything quite like that. There's an awful lot of faith-based programs that are volunteer mm -hmm. programs, mm -hmm. but not so much that. And so that kind of led me to start looking for a way in which took another two years. Mm -hmm. Then I had a friend that I teach with at Tulsa School of Arts and Sciences, and um, he was doing spoken word poetry yeah. with men at the Tulsa jail. Okay. And I said, can I tag along? And he said, sure, come on. And so after that night, I said, we need to do this with the women. Mm -hmm. So along with another spoken word poet, Claire Collins, uh, she and I started it. We didn't know what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And just started going to the Tulsa County Jail, and now four years later, we're in every women's prison and the Tulsa County Jail, and we have 20 volunteers. So, so what's a typical day like when you go into one of these facilities? <laughs> typical is an interesting word to use because I don't <laughs> know if there's a typical, okay. but it depends on the facility. Mm -hmm. When we go to the Tulsa County Jail, um, there's a real trans transitory population there. The women are waiting to be sentenced or they're waiting to be released. So they're in kind of a, a triage situation where we're just trying to help them in that moment. Mm -hmm. And so we usually have two or three volunteers and in every class at every facility we kind of start with an icebreaker uh, just to kind of transition from where they were to the room that we're in and we do a meditation, some deep breathing, and then we ask them to make rules. Okay. for making it a safe place to write and to share their writing. And honestly, when you ask people who are incarcerated to make the rules, and the, it's legitimate, they're just kind of dumbfounded. Mm -hmm. And then we usually introduce the prompt that we're going to write about that night, show some example poems, and then we give them time to write, and we write with them. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards they share their writing, and they have an opportunity after they share their writing to ask for comments or questions or just silence. So really the whole, a lot of the kind of what educators call hidden curriculum is mm -hmm. you matter. Yeah. You have agency. You are a person of worth. When we were talking a little bit about the project before, you said that a word that describes the feeling of incarceration is shame. Mm -hmm. So how does writing address that shame? Oh. It's tough. I think about shame as being like a locked box mm -hmm. deep in your heart. And you think because it's locked that it's taken care of. Mm -hmm. But what you don't know is it's ready to ambush you at any moment. And mm -hmm. when you open it up, it's full of things that could honestly kill you. So most of the women that we work with have shame from childhood abuse. Mm -hmm. And then added on to that is shame from whatever landed them in prison or jail. And then there's also just kind of free-floating shame where they're just ashamed as mothers, ashamed as grandmothers, as sisters, as daughters. And so we try to really address that. We ask them to look at what Brené Brown calls the shame gremlins. Mm -hmm. What are the voices that they hear in the night, those hate voices? And then we ask them to speak to themselves the way they would speak to somebody that they love most in the world, mm -hmm. and then to write about it write about what brought that shame and replace it. Last night we did a, kind of the follow-up to the shame where we had them write one positive, pure memory that they could keep and that every time that shame gremlin arose, they could have that positive memory and we put it on, they decorated paper and they wrote it and it's almost like a, um, a talisman they can carry with them mm -hmm. that can bring healing. Wow. So um, you use a few prompts 
to get the writing process started. And um, I notice that some of the prompts you use are um, poems or based on poems mm -hmm. by Patricia Smith or Ann Sexton, also Lauren Zuniga right here in Oklahoma. What is it about poetry in particular that is um, helpful for a project like this? Well, there's no rules. Yeah. Um, and I think most of the women have come from the very bottom of the hierarchy, both mm -hmm. educationally and otherwise. And so when there's no rules, it frees eloquence in them. It mm -hmm. releases their voices. And they can write about things that they couldn't if you just said write a short story or an essay. Yeah. So I love that it is a form that accommodates everybody. Mm -hmm. Well, you've shared with me some beautiful anthologies of the poems that these women have written. And I wanted to make sure we had time to share some of those poems. So um, let's start with some poems by Geneva Phillips. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit more about her? Geneva was in a, our first class at Mabel Bassett when we went. And she and I just got to be friends. We've had since then several other classes that have had those same women. Mm -hmm. And she's, every time you're a teacher, you have somebody in your class that I said calls you out if you're not being true and honest to what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. <laughs> and that can be threatening for some teachers, but I welcome students mm -hmm. like that. I like students that are saying, are you supposed to be doing this now? Or you said you were going to do this. And Geneva was that person. Uh -huh. So we immediately hit it off. And honestly, her writing is just beautiful. She mm -hmm. writes in a way that I have never written. Yeah. Well, one of her poems is called Gray. Do you want yeah. to share that with us? Gray describes her experience in prison. Um, Gray. Gray, galvanized interlocking mesh wire wall adorned with silver. Concertina's slashing deterrent. A lone man with a gun prowls round and round the perimeter. Gray, cinder block construct, every window's frames, two stories, self and Sally, Sally and self. Each brick embossed with countless signatures, converted to days, multiplied by years, subtracted by death, erased by the time that hold captive. Gray. Designation, a desultory destination, repeating patterns of monotony, concealing atrocities behind the facade. Humane habitation for monsters or a monstrous habitat for humans. Perceptions divided by gray. Galvanized, interlocking, mesh wire wall, concertina's silver adornment, a slashing deterrent. Made, pounded, flat, folded, turned. Pounded, flat, folded, turned. Pounded, flat, folded, turned. Pounded, flat, folded, turned. Pounded, flat, pounded, flat, a thousand times. This is how a sword is made. This is how a warrior is made. This is how a woman is made. Wow, thank you. That poem really speaks, I think, to this relationship between trauma and incarceration. Mm -hmm. um, what have you learned about that relationship? Well, Dr. Susan Sharp at OU um, did kind of the beginning research on this. And honestly, her book is what first sparked my interest in this. And she found that conservatively, 80 to 90 percent of women who are incarcerated have suffered childhood or adult trauma, uh, physical, sexual, you name it. And so when you bring that into prison, it doesn't just go away. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it just layers on. And one of the things Geneva said once was that prison strips your gender from you. You no longer even feel like a woman. You know, you're not allowed makeup, you're not allowed jewelry, you only wear gray, and you start to feel less than human. Wow. Well, I've become a big fan of Geneva's poems having looked at these anthologies, <laughs> but um, I wanted to ask you a little more, too, about the situation of harsh punishment for women um, in Oklahoma who um, are convicted of drug offenses. And I was reading a little bit more about this, and I was reading um, an investigation from the frontier um, right. about uh -huh. the 
disproportionate a way that the disproportionate way that sentencing impacts African American, Native American women, other women of color, also poor women. Mm -hmm. So, how does this vulnerability among certain populations in Oklahoma show itself in the work that you do? I think we see it primarily with Native American women. Mm -hmm. um, in the Tulsa County Jail, we'll see more of a mix. Mm -hmm. But at Mabel Bassett, we get an awful lot of women from small towns in Oklahoma who have harsher sentences. Mm -hmm. So if you are at Eddie Warrior, which is north of Tulsa, that is usually the women that have 10 years or less. Mm -hmm. And you'll see more women of color there because they've come from Oklahoma City or Tulsa that are doing lesser sentences for mm -hmm. crimes. Mm -hmm. But many of the small towns in Oklahoma have disproportionately harsher sentences. Mm -hmm. And it really produces a lot of hopelessness. Mm -hmm. um, one of the coping mechanisms you see a lot at Mabel Bassett is cutting, mm. you know, self-harm. And the first time I encountered that, I was just appalled. And then one night at class, several of the women, it turns out quite a few have tried this, gave me just their reasoning of why it was okay to do it. Mm -hmm. And I was just kind of flabbergasted. Mm. You know, they said, we're not hurting anybody else. We're not breaking a law. And I just thought there has to be a better way. Yeah. There has to be a better way. Well, um, there's a poem by a woman named Lisa Batone that I wanted to invite you to read. And it's ab about this healing potential. Batone. Um, Lisa is um, absentee Shawnee. And I made the mistake of just calling her Shawnee one night uh -huh. and got a half hour lecture on the history of the absentee Shawnee. Uh -huh. And she comes from a long line of chiefs and leaders in her tribe. And this is called Tataqua Nomena. Down a dirt road so winding away from the outside world, unknowing and hiding, a dance ground is alive and breathing, breathing life into its people fire dancing as if choreographed by God, wood popping, smoke penetrating all in its path, the sturdy long table filled with food galore, kids laughing and playing till they can't play no more, family and friends visiting, catching up since the last dance, making the grounds smile by fulfillment. I feel like I've won the lottery to be born into this. Tataqua no me na. I am home. Wow. There's just so much um, in that poem that speaks to healing, even mm -hmm. if it's only in memory. And I know yeah. that's something that you've talked a lot about in terms of the project. The hope of the project is the hope for healing. Um, I want to give you a chance to talk about a couple other initiatives that you're involved in right now. One is a documentary that you've completed or that you've worked um, with others to complete. Uh -huh. And then you also have this Into the Heartland tour <laughs> that you're embarking upon. So as we've worked with the women there, I think one of the things that they feel acutely is that they're forgotten, mm -hmm. that nobody knows what's going on. Um, and it's interesting that even one advocate can make a difference. There's a woman in one of our classes who her dad shot her when she was eight years old, lost mm -hmm. her sight. Mm -hmm. and. Mabel Bassett said that she wanted to get her GED and they said we don't have any services for that. Mm -hmm. So I made a call to the Oklahoma Council for the Blind and within a week she was in classes. So I think that really sparks something in all of us volunteers that if you could see these incarcerated women as human beings, mm -hmm. maybe, just maybe, that would start to change Oklahoma's view and eventually the laws concerning them. And so um, Scissor Tail Media in Oklahoma City approached us about doing kind of a documentary on what we did. And it turned into, rather than a five minute short, it was 24 minutes. Mm -hmm. And it's not only about our classes, but it's also about just the state of Oklahoma and where we are with this issue. So when we showed it here in Tulsa, um, one of the people in the audience told us the story of William Wilberforce. He's the guy that helped to bring about the end of slavery in England in the 1700s, and he did it one by one. He said, you don't change the laws, you change the hearts of people. So he would have dinner parties and invite people over and take them on a visit to see the slave ships. And so something sparked in me, and I thought, what if we took this to every county in Oklahoma? Yeah. 
<laughs> not being an Oklahoman, I had no idea we had 77 counties, which yeah. we do, 77. But Oklahoma is also really interconnected. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take long before you can s find somebody that says, oh, yeah, I know somebody from Alfalfa County or Texas uh -huh. County or Cimarron. You can show it there. Or what about showing it at RSU or OSU or yeah. OU? So we have right now, I think, 11 different counties scheduled. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping by November 2018 to do this in all of them. And we'll do, we'll show the documentary, we'll do some readings of poetry, and then a Q&A panel afterwards that'll have poetic justice people, but also formerly incarcerated women on the panel. Wow, wow. Well, how can people watching get involved or support what you're doing? Well, you can go to our Facebook page, mm -hmm. uh, Poetic Justice Oklahoma, or you can uh, go to our website, poeticjustice.org. And I mean, one way, honestly, is we have no grants. We are just funded one by one, little by little. Mm -hmm. So anything you give would help towards, you know, producing these books, mm -hmm. as well as the cost for classes that we go to. Um, and then I think just contacting your state legislature. Mm -hmm. Find out who they are. Mm -hmm. Give them a call. Mm -hmm. They probably won't answer, but you can leave a <laughs> message. And it makes a difference. Right. I, I think this is a woman's issue in Oklahoma. Right. And I think if the women in, of Oklahoma were angry and rose up, something would change. All right, well, we have our marching orders. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And thank you for watching Words on Air. Mm -hmm.